Hello, everyone. I would like to thank, welcome you all to part one of our three-part risk advisory webinar series. Please join us for our other webinars this fall, which are listed here. Today, we will be focusing on engaging your board in risk management. My name is Melissa Musser. I am Partner Director of Risk Advisory Services here at GRF CPAs and Advisors. I will be today's session moderator. GRF is an audit and advisory firm located in the Washington DC Metro servicing clients across the United States and also all around the globe. I'd like to start off today with some quick housekeeping items and explain what you'll need to do in order to earn CPE credit. Participants seeking CPE must complete and submit a short evaluation survey that will appear automatically following the webinar. You'll be asked to recall these words in order to receive credit. Please write down the CPE words, and when they are given, hold on to them until you receive your certificate. They will not be provided again. The slide deck and recording from today's discussion will also be available on the event page on our website. It is now time to introduce the speakers for today's webinar. We have an amazing risk and advisory services team. And here we have a few members of our team. If you guys would go ahead and uh, please introduce yourselves. Hi hey everyone, my name is Mac Lillard. I'm a senior manager with GRF and the risk and advisory services group. I focus on providing internal audit services to our clients with a particular emphasis in information systems, cybersecurity and fraud and forensic auditing. I did just want to let everybody know that I will actually also be presenting at those other two presentations you saw at the beginning over cybersecurity and fraud and forensic auditing over the next couple of months. So would really love any feedback that you're willing to provide, any ideas for session topics or things that are uh, up top of mind for your organization, any high risks that have been identified as it relates to cybersecurity, information technology, fraud and forensic auditing. Would love any of your feedback and hope you enjoy today's presentation. I'll turn it over to Amy to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Amy Wares. I help design and implement enterprise risk management activities. I also manage GRF's co-sponsored events with NC State University's ERM initiative. So if you're interested in learning more about ERM, I encourage you to join our next virtual workshop, which will be on February 23rd and 24th. Details will be posted soon on our website, but feel free to email me for more information. And I'm Kristen Ocampo. I'm a senior internal auditor here at GRF. I have many years of experience as an auditor, first as a external financial statement auditor at several CPA firms, then as an in-house internal auditor with a company in Washington, DC, and then currently as a co-sourced outsourced internal auditor with the risk and advisory services team here at GRF. It's great to meet everyone virtually and uh, hand it back to you, Melissa. All right, thanks. You guys are in good hands today with this amazing team. Um, I think at the last page, you'll have everyone's contact information. Any questions we're not able to address, feel free to reach out to any of us or even connect with us on LinkedIn. It'll be great. <laughs> All right, agenda. Um, so basically, we're going to talk a little bit about background on the board of direct directors risk oversight responsibilities, because this is a responsibility to them. And so we want to be able to provide them with the information they need to in order to govern the organization properly. Next, uh, we're going to talk about just communicating and reporting within the different groups within an organization and what that can look like. And then, and then next, um, tips on how best to communicate risks to the board of directors. I know Mac's going to cover that in some pretty good detail. And then we're just going to wrap up with some next steps and some Q&A if there's time. All right, so our first polling question. How often does your board discuss risk? A, every meeting, B, more than once a year, but not every meeting, once a year, um, sporadic as risks arise or rarely or never. Okay, so it looks like there's a large group with sporadic or as risks arise, and this is pretty consistent with our experience. So hopefully those of you who would like your board to be more engaged will find this webinar useful. 
So next slide. So let's talk about uh, the board of directors risk oversight responsibilities. A board of directors has three main responsibilities related to risk oversight. First, it needs to understand the risk management process that the management team has in place and feel comfortable that this process will ensure that the most critical risks are being monitored and managed. Second, the board should understand what the organization's most critical risks are and how it is responding to these risks. Third, the board should provide guidance on risk appetite or the amount of risk an organization is willing to take. Next. Okay, let's start by looking at a common approach to risk management called ERM or enterprise risk management. So after the events of the last few years, no one needs convincing that risk needs to be taken seriously. But how we think about managing risk is changing. It used to be all about having the right insurance and was something that was handled within the functions of various departments of an organization. So finance would look at financial risk, IT would look at technology risk. The problem is that most risks can't be insured against and the risks that tend to have the most impact are those that fall between or across organizational silos. There are many risks that are external to the organization and no one may be tracking them or they may affect multiple areas so people assume someone else is dealing with them. So enterprise risk management takes a holistic view of the organization and uses a top-down approach. It intends to support an organization's strategy and goals, because whenever you're aiming for something to happen in the future, there's going to be uncertainty and that means risk. So ERM strengthens the link between strategic planning and risk management. Thinking about risk neutrally as just uncertainty is another key element of ERM. When most people think about risk, they tend to think of the bad things that can happen, but uncertainty can also result in positive outcomes or opportunities. And positive and negative outcomes are often associated with the same risk event. As terrible as a pandemic has been, there have been some upsides. Many work environments have become more flexible and many organizations have found opportunities online that just weren't possible before the pandemic when people were less comfortable engaging virtually. So what we are trying to do with ERM is reduce the negative impact of uncertainty and position ourselves to take advantage of opportunities. Next. The details of how risk management is implemented will vary across organizations based on their needs, structure, and culture, but there are some common elements. Because the most effective risk management is linked to an organization's goals and strategy. Before even beginning to think about risk, it is essential to clarify risk to what. So we start by asking, what are we trying to achieve? And then what are the biggest unknowns associated with those goals? What might happen to prevent us from achieving our objectives? What might happen that could improve our ability to achieve our objectives? There are many methods that support risk identification. Typically interviews and surveys are used, but there are a variety of techniques, including process flow analysis or scenario analysis that provide a more complete understanding of the key areas of uncertainty. Brainstorming generally leads to way more risks than can practically be addressed. So they need to be prioritized. The most common way of doing this is assessing the likelihood a risk will occur, and the impact should it occur. But again, there are many ways to do this. The method isn't as important as the outcome of identifying the most critical risks that require the most attention and should be addressed first. Once the risks are prioritized, then you need to decide what to do about them. People tend to think first about mitigating or reducing risk, but in some cases, it may make sense to avoid a risk entirely. For example, by deciding not to do a certain activity or work with a certain partner. You can also share a risk through insurance or outsourcing. And 
there may be some risks that are important to be aware of, but realistically, you're not going to do anything about them. And you may choose to simply accept risks that are very low likelihood or very low impact. Finally, it is important that there are strong and systematic approaches in place for monitoring and communicating risk information throughout the organization and with the board of directors. Now, the board of, the board of directors doesn't need to know all the details of this process, but it should understand at a high level how management is addressing risk. To strengthen the link between risk management and strategy, it is best practice to establish a management level risk council. Now, this doesn't have to be a new or separate committee. It can be a group that already meets like a leadership team and adds an agenda item for discussing risk. What's most important is that there's regular executive level discussion on risk. The risk council or executive team is responsible for prioritizing risks and ensuring that risks are being managed appropriately. The risk council typically provides updates directly to the board of directors to help them fulfill their risk oversight responsibilities. And sometimes this responsibility is delegated to a risk committee or to an audit committee. An update to the full board should happen at least once per year, but many organizations provide quarterly updates or include summaries of key risks and responses to them in materials provided for each board meeting, even if discussing risk is not on the agenda. Note that the arrows go both ways. So risk information flows in all directions throughout the organization. And programs and functional departments will continue to manage their own risks, but there will also be a channel for escalating any risks that could have organi organization-wide impact to the risk council. And this allows for a faster and more coordinated response. And we found that the risk reporting process is not just helpful for the board, but it's also helpful for management. First, it keeps the process going. When there's so much going on right now, it's tempting to put off discussions of what may or may not happen in the future. So regular reporting to the board can keep the risk management process on track so the organization isn't blindsided by risks that should have been monitored. Also, because the board is not going to be getting into the details of each risk, risk information needs to be synthesized, kept high level, and linked with strategy. So taking a step back and viewing it this way can provide a clearer picture of an organization's portfolio of risks and help determine where there may be concentrations of risks or over-reliance on certain risk responses. Next. The final element is risk appetite. Risk appetite is the amount and type of risk that an organization is willing to accept. Difficult decisions require assessing uncertainty and weighing opportunities against potential downsides. An organization with a higher risk appetite is more willing to take on greater, greater uncertainty in exchange for the potential for more results. An organization with a lower risk appetite is willing to sacrifice some growth for more stability. And the concept of risk appetite recognizes that lower levels of risk are, it's not always better. So being overly cautious or assuming too little risk can cause the organization to underperform relative to its potential. So risk appetite is a guide for helping organizations make decisions and establish the guardrails. So management understands what the board views as too much risk and those areas where the organization could be taking more risk. Risk appetite can be defined in a detailed way with many levels like the example here, averse, cautious, flexible, open, or it can simply be low, medium, and high. In practice, there will not be just one overarching risk appetite. Willingness to accept legal or compliance risks will likely be very different from willingness to accept program or product risks. So an organization may have many risk appetites, and this can be complex and challenging to articulate. 
And if board members aren't fully accustomed to discussing risk, they can also conflate their personal risk appetite with the organization's risk appetite. So discussions about risk, risk appetite can be helpful, but a formal risk appetite statement is generally developed once a structured risk management process is already in place. And now it is time for our next polling question. All right. Does your organization have an internal audit function? A, yes. Let's see, B, no, or C, unsure. Please take a moment now to answer. While participants are submitting their answers, I'll provide the second CPE word. The first CPE word is in the chat, but the second CPE word is process. If you wanna receive CPE credit, please jot down the, this word because you'll need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the second CPE word is process. Great, well, um, it looks like there is a mix of responses. So there are a few in attendance who have an internal audit function, um, a few more who do not, and, and a few who are unsure. So um, that's actually a great mix to go into our next session um, or our next portion of the session. And we'll address um, those of you who do have internal audit functions and those of you who don't, and maybe some alternatives that you could use as well. So if we just move to the first kind of introductory slide in this section, communication between risk management, internal audit, and governance. To start, I just wanted to mention, you know, why we decided to put this section into an ERM webinar. And that's because we wanted to address the topic of risk management assurance. What is assurance over risk management? That's an assessment or review by an independent objective party over a specific high risk area that's been identified by management. And the assessment will point out gaps in the risk management process and provide recommendations to enhance the process of managing risk. So there's a few different ways that an organization can obtain risk management assurance. One option, of course, is for an organization to have an internal audit shop. And that could take the form of an in-house internal audit team where all of the employees are part, or all of the internal audit team are employees of the organization. There's the option to have an in-house team plus a co-sourcing partner who helps provide additional staffing and expertise. GRF actually frequently works as a co-sourced internal audit partner. And a third option is for the internal audit function to be outsourced, including the chief audit executive. Now, if your organization doesn't have an internal audit department, but you would still like to get that independent and objective feedback on specific sections of your risk management process on your high risk areas, one option is to engage an outside party to conduct a risk process review. And GRF actually performs quite a few of these and smaller organizations often find them cost-effective ways to get feedback on their highest risk areas. If we move to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about the benefits of risk management assurance. And I'll read through these. Keep in mind, not all benefits will apply to every organization, depending on your size and industry. Um, the first one, improved processes and controls. That, that one actually is pretty universal to, to all organizations. Board assurance, um, giving the board confidence that a particular high-risk area is well-managed. Smoother system implementations. Um, so either an internal audit or a risk process review can assess the implementation of a new system, be that an accounting system or a donor database. Third party risk management. Um, and so that's looking at vendors that you may contract with, compliance with laws and regulations, support for strategic planning, preparation for external audits, improved culture, and improved risk management strategies. And then if you're in the nonprofit sector, greater transparency around your donor reporting. On the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship between risk management, internal audit, and the board. 
And what we'll do is we'll start by talking about how a traditional internal audit shop interacts with the board and risk management. And then we'll make a few notes about how that might look different if you don't have an internal audit function and you're going to use a risk process review instead. So when talking about internal audit and the board of directors, a good foundational place to start is the Institute of Internal Auditors three lines model. The model used to be known as the three lines of defense, but that's been updated and replaced by this three lines model that's on the slide. So what does this model say about internal audit and the board? Well, there are two separate arrows connecting the governing body, so that's the board of directors, and internal audit. The downward arrow indicates that the board oversees internal audit. And there are a number of different tasks that the board performs as part of their oversight responsibilities. One of the most important related to risk management is the approval of the internal audit plan. And we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in a few slides. From the internal audit side, um, which is that upward arrow, internal audit provides the board with independent and objective assurance, including assurance over risk management. And the head of internal audit, which is the chief audit executive or the CAE, communicates directly with the board of directors, the results of those assurance activities. If we move clockwise on the model, the next relationship is between internal audit and management. And there's a two directional arrow between those groups. So that indicates that one group doesn't oversee the other, but that those two groups should communicate and coordinate and collaborate with each other. And then the final relationship, again, moving clockwise in the model, is that between risk management and the board. And I know Amy kind of touched on that in her slide on risk reporting, and Matt will expand on that in the next section of the presentation. So if your organization doesn't have an internal audit function, who would be responsible for engaging a risk process review? In that case, that could actually be management or the board of directors. And then the results of that review could be communicated just to management, just to the board, or to both. Typically, if the board engages an outside party to do a review, they would like to see the report. Um, but in many cases, um, the report would go directly to management. The most important part of engaging a party to do a risk management process is that that individual or that outside consultant is independent from the individuals at your organization who are managing those risks. If we move to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about um, how a traditional internal audit function communicates with the board of directors. Um, those of you who um, have internal audit functions at your organization may be familiar that the chief audit executive engages with the board either during full board meetings or board committee meetings, such as audit committee or risk committee meetings. And the chief audit executive can actually also meet with board members outside of board meetings and can meet with the board without management as well. And if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about the internal audit plan. So the internal audit plan is something that, again, a traditional internal audit shop would put together annually it lists the audits that they plan to cover during the year. During the process of preparing the plan, internal audit would gather feedback from management and the board, and the board ultimately approves the plan. Risks are monitored on an ongoing basis, so that's part of the collaboration communication between risk management and internal audit. And any changes to the plan that need to be made as a result of new or reprioritized risks are approved by the board. So what would that process look like if you don't have an internal audit department? Um, the risk council could make a list of the organization's highest risks and determine which areas they would like to have reviewed by an outside party in a risk process review. And this is also a good point to talk about the fact that risk management assurance isn't the final step in the risk management process, but it's really an ongoing part of the process because risks aren't stagnant. They'll change over time, they'll become reprioritized. And so ongoing assurance over 
key risk for an organization is something that will happen throughout the risk management process. If we move to the next slide, we'll see just some examples of internal audit or risk process reviews. The first column in the table just shows the name of the review. And then the second column would be where an internal audit department could estimate the resources required to complete each audit. Typically, high risk areas would be allocated more hours. Um, you know, the only exception to that might be if a regulator requires an audit of a low risk area that happens to be very complex. That might be an instance where you would see a low risk area with a high um, resource allocation. This is also a great time for internal audit to think about whether they have the staff to complete their internal audit plan or whether they would need to get co-sourcing help. Risk management or a risk council could put together a similar table of risk process reviews um, that are that they'd like to undertake and kind of prioritize them in that way. We can move to the next slide and talk about internal audit observations. So internal audit or risk process observations are one of the results of internal audit engagements. And the content of these observations is fairly similar depending on whether an internal audit or risk process review is conducted. And typically the observation is linked to a specific risk. So just as an example, maybe there's an observation stating that employees are clicking on malicious links in their emails that leaves the organization open to a cyber attack. That observation could tie into a number of risks. It could be risk of financial loss, um, disruption to operations, so operational risk. Some organizations might also tie that to reputational risk if a data breach causes customer or donor data to be compromised. Once a risk, um, once an observation is presented to management, management has a few different options as to how to respond. And Amy touched on what these different options are. Um, so I'll just briefly, um, again, repeat them. Um, so one is to develop a plan to reduce or mitigate the risk. Um, so for example, with a cyber attack, a corrective action plan could be to implement employee cyber awareness training. Um, there's the option to eliminate or avoid risks. There's an option to transfer risks and the option to accept the risk. And I think Amy mentioned this, but that is most common in low risk observations that would be difficult or costly to implement. In a traditional internal audit department, these observations and management's response and progress toward completing their corrective action plans are reported by internal audit to the board of directors. If you don't have an internal audit department, management will track those action plans themselves and can discuss the progress with the board. And moving to our last slide, um, we just wanted to show some resources. Um, if there are any internal auditors who are part of the audience today, or if you know any internal auditors who are interested in learning more about how to provide risk management assurance, the Institute of Internal Auditors offers a few resources, a certification in risk management assurance, and they also offer a COSO Enterprise Risk Management Certificate Program if your organization uses COSO. And there's more details at the Institute of Internal Auditors website. So I think that concludes this portion of the presentation. And we'll move to the next polling question. All right, good job. Um, so the next polling question, does your organization have defined key risk or key performance indicators, kind of known as KRIs or KPIs. Um, you can mark yes, no, certain departments do or unsure. Uh, please take a moment now to answer. And while participants are submitting their answers, I'll provide the third CPE word. The word is action. If you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down because you'll need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, the third CPE word is action. All right, and it looks like our responses for this one are are pretty even. Um, and the, the most responses, unfortunately, are no. Um, well, we've got some yes, and then certain departments track their own KPIs and KRIs. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but 
Um, you know, any, any risk or any performance indicator that internal audit or risk management is going to be following up on should have some sort of KPI or KRI defined in order to, to appropriately monitor and assess that risk or that performance area in order to make sure that the organization is staying on track with meeting any of its their targets or goals or just making sure that they're properly mitigating any sort of risk or implementing any sort of process improvement as it was designed and that they're reaching any kind of goal that they've set for themselves. Um, so I did just want to kind of take, you know, during this section, we talked a little bit about enterprise risk management and internal audit and talked about the, the overlap there. So I really just wanted to, to drive that home. And in regards to Kristen's last slide, just over the, the new initiatives that the Institute of Internal Auditors is going through and, and offering this new risk management assurance certificate and putting out a, a program over COSO, this is really just goes to show you know how even the Institute of Internal Auditors has really defined this as a priority that these professionals need to not just be internal audit professionals, they need to be risk management professionals, because that's just going to make them more efficient and be to do a better job in terms of managing risks on an ongoing basis as it relates to the internal audit procedures they perform for their organizations. So I wanted to stop to talk a little bit about just communicating these items to the board, and this is going to be relevant for the ERM process. This is also going to be relevant for the internal audit process. Uh, so one of the most important things is just education. Uh, you know, we do see a lot of times a lot of organizations fall short on really educating their board on the top risks, the top priorities, any kind of upcoming standards or regulations that are really going to impact the board or maybe even certain things that they're going to be presented with over the next 12 months. So one example of this is SAS 145. This is something that goes into effect for fiscal years ending after December 15th, 2023. So there's some time in between now and then and when that goes into effect. But this is a statement on auditing standards that is actually a responsibility of external auditors to gain and document um, you know, more processes and more information as it relates to their risk assessment process. So part of that is actually emphasizing certain aspects of the external audit process that maybe didn't receive such emphasis in the prior years. Uh, and one of those is information technology. As we know, information technology and cybersecurity has been a risk for all organizations, particularly over the past couple of years as everyone's transitioned to remote working environments, implemented significant changes in regards to their IT infrastructure are now leveraging third parties and cloud-based applications. Uh, this is something that the external audit process is now going to focus more heavily on. Um, so making sure that your board is aware of that, because ultimately, as they go to review the external audit reports, there may be findings, there may be comments in there related to these new standards and, you know, some areas and where the organization may have fallen short as it relates to SAS 145. So educating your board on the implications for the organization so that they understand, okay, maybe we need to perform some sort of information technology assessment using our internal audit department or using an outsourced consultant through some sort of risk process review in order to make sure that our organization is ready, that our policies, procedures are defined, and that we have the appropriate controls in place, and that our team is ready and able to respond to any audit um, requests that might be coming down the pipeline that we're not necessarily used to. So you always wanna focus on providing a high level overview to the board. Uh, you don't wanna get that you know, bogged down in the weeds. Um, so focus on the, the highest risk to the organization. And, and in regards to those monitoring and reporting, I think Amy had touched on this during her uh, just talking about, you know, the flow of information between the risk council and the board. It's important to leverage existing meetings. Um, you know, the board already meets on a regular basis. Add this as a recurring agenda item to make sure not only is the board hearing about the, the highest or the most critical risks as of that date, but that they're also following up on any critical or high risks that were identified in the past. And that something's not just getting reported on and then kind of forgotten about, but that the board is actually getting information on the follow-up action, any sort of mitigation efforts and whether or not a critical or high risk has been reduced to the level of a, a moderate or low risk. Um, so again, focusing on those higher critical risks um, and not getting bogged down in, in every single risk that's facing the organization. Avoid getting too granular and using technical jargon. You know, that's easy to say, particularly when you get into things like IT and cybersecurity, uh, you know, the jargon around that can really go over some people's heads. So making sure that you're breaking things down in an easy to understand format is really important for just being able to digest that information. One way to use that is dashboards and scorecards. I'll go into detail on a scorecard on the next slide. Uh, and even though I'm sure 
no one can even really read this. I did just want to present this as kind of a little screenshot because if you can see this just this is an example of a dashboard that breaks um, a cybersecurity assessment down into a relatively easy grading mechanism. You know, anybody who went to elementary school can understand that you you want to get to an A. If you're at a C, there's a lot of room for improvement. If you're at a D or an F, you're doing poorly. You really need to ramp things up. You need to allocate resources to, to there immediately. So this is a great snapshot to present to the board because again, somebody who maybe doesn't have the IT savviness, they can at least understand, all right, B minus, okay, we've got some room for improvement, but we're not doing too bad. And then you can actually click on each one of these if you were to, to see this as an interactive link. And you can get into more granular information as to what exactly the vulnerabilities were that were identified, the deficiencies that were noted. And for somebody who you might have on the board who has that IT sophistication or maybe even works as a managed service provider or an IT consultant, they can then use that more granular information to really assess and really provide value to the organization by getting in there and reviewing that. But that this little snapshot and this report will be useful for anybody and everybody that sits on the board. So I wanted to go into a risk scorecard. Again, this is something that's just extremely useful um, to, to put together to really just focus on the, again, that high level overview of where a current risk sits. I do want to note that this is a pretty advanced risk scorecard. This has a lot of information on it. Velocity is, is a kind of a more advanced ERM concept. Uh, but, you know, at a minimum, we typically like to see the uh, impact the likelihood risk owner, and then these mitigation efforts, takeaways, key risk indicators if your organization has developed this. But as you can see, it really just focuses on providing the highlights, what the risk is, what the current mitigation efforts are, what the current status of those mitigation efforts are, and then maybe some key takeaways as to how this is going to benefit the organization, if there's any sort of opportunity that's provided by mitigating that risk any sort of other uh, relevant or pertinent information that the board should be aware of can be communicated within this key takeaway area. Uh, but again, these risk scorecards are just great ways to, to educate the board. And these are also maintained just in accordance with normal enterprise risk management policies and procedures. These are used by the ERM group to track and monitor risks. So this is something that's most likely if, again, your organization has a, a formal or, or kind of a, a developed ERM program, this is something that's readily available that can be provided uh, as a reporting tool to the board. Oops, sorry. And now I just want to talk about key performance indicators and key risk indicators. Um, Again, as I mentioned, for any sort of risk that's been identified, if possible, it's it's great to be able to quantify some sort of key performance or key risk indicator. So a key performance indicator um, is, again, going to assess your performance in accordance with a, a particular goal. Um, so this is a decision-making tool provided by key measures of performance, uh, whereas a risk indicator is going to uh, you know, be a threshold that you set out to determine when your organization, when you've exceeded a certain risk threshold, uh, again, based on your risk appetite, once a certain risk has surpassed a certain threshold and elevated that to maybe a, a more prioritized level, uh, that key risk indicator is going to assist in providing that type of information. So to give an example relating this to a risk that is facing a lot of organizations today, and actually Somebody did put a, a question about HR risk management into the question and answer. Unfortunately, we're not going to be touching on any specific risks today, so we won't be going into detail over HR risk management. This does really a little bit uh, because just <laughs> luckily enough, uh, my example is over talent management, because again, this is something that has been kind of plaguing all organizations since the great resignation under COVID. Uh, so again, if that is something that your organization has identified as a high risk, it's possible that maybe within your internal audit plan, you've also already identified the need to perform a, a payroll or some sort of human resources audit. Uh, so assuming man or risk management and internal audit are communicating, risk management can inform internal audit that, you know what, we've identified talent management as a significant risk, specifically as it relates to turnover. Um, so when you all are going through and performing your procedures and looking at our staff listing, can you provide information related to the turnover ratios at the organization? Um, so, you know, maybe say your or maybe last year you had a 20% turnover ratio, really need to bring that down. You're aiming between a five to 10% threshold. Well, that key performance indicator can be set at 5%. So if you're anywhere below the uh, 
or in between zero to 5%, you're doing great. You're meeting your objectives, whatever you've done over the past few months to increase employee engagement, increase your benefits, improve upon employee morale, that appears to be working. I would perform an assessment over that to, to identify exactly what it is that's helping and then work to continuously improve. If you're in that five to 10% range, you're kind of meeting your goal. That's where you wanna be. If you're exceeding that 10% range of turnover, all right, what have we implemented in the past few months? It doesn't appear to be working. Has there been anything that happened in the past couple of months that caused um, you know, significant turnover? How are we gonna improve upon this process? Because whatever it is that we've done to implement mitigating efforts hasn't been working because we're still exceeding that level of 10% that we don't wanna be at in terms of our turnover. So that's just one example around talent management of how to set a, a performance indicator as well as a risk indicator around something that, that again, really is, is a concern for most organizations. So again, that's worth just that, the importance of communicating this information to between uh, risk management and internal audit because internal audit can assist in pulling together those metrics and providing independent objective uh, information to the board as well. Uh, you know, if it is a concern again of the board that they're still not continuing to, to meet certain uh, objectives or goals, internal audit can assist in reporting on these sorts of KPIs and KRIs to the board at those regular meetings and keeping them informed of any of the uh, kind of success or failure as it relates to those mitigating efforts. And then this is just the, the normal enterprise risk management cycle, starting with strategy and objective setting, uh, ending oops, sorry, ending at um, uh, you know, risk reporting and going in that, that circular direction. Um, so I did just kind of want to, you know, I don't want to focus on all of these. I really just wanted to go to risk management and reporting because again, that really shows the the tie-in between ERM and internal audit. So internal audit includes the key business processes for mitigating enterprise risks within the, the annual audit plan. Uh, so again, this is really where internal audit can provide the most value to the ERM program in assessing any sort of risks that need additional information, coming up with potential observations and recommendations as to how to mitigate or address those risks, like Amy and Kristen went through, you know, whether or not we, we can implement something internally to mitigate this or whether the best uh, course of action would be to actually transfer or share this risk by bringing in a partner or obtaining some sort of insurance policy. And then within the risk reporting, you actually kind of have now two bodies that are reporting. The ERM program is going to be reporting on their risks, um, what they have been doing as far as mitigation efforts. And then you'll also have some follow-up reporting from the internal audit group uh, to the board of directors as to how they've assessed the, the ERM's program uh, and in terms of how they've gone about addressing some of the, the key risks. So now the board is getting information from two different places and those two groups that are providing that information are also working together. So the board is getting more relevant, more useful information, and they're getting the whole picture as to how this internal audit activity feeds into the ERM program and vice versa. And on this slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the ERM program maturity. Uh, it is a best practice to perform some sort of assessment on an annual basis over your ERM activities. So benchmarking your organization against other organizations, against a particular framework, uh, you know, whatever a maturity or whatever that assessment might look like for your organization. Internal audit can again, assist in performing these benchmarks. They do provide that independent and objective view. Um, they can also assist in performing board governance satisfaction surveys to understand if there's any pain points that have been identified in the risk management process, how they feel about the information being given to them at the annual board meetings, any potential changes and reports that they would like to see to, again, make that information a little bit more relevant, more useful, uh, identify any training needs and so on and so forth. Um, they can then, you know, again, assist in uh, reporting to the board, providing observations and recommendations for process improvements, systems, slash application enhancements, and other value added solutions. So not only can internal audit and risk management just help one another in performing their day-to-day -day functions, but internal audit can actually assist ERM in assessing their overall performance on an annual basis and just working to continuously improve upon the risk management process implemented at the organization. So with that, I just wanted to um, summarize just, just some next steps for everybody. So 
first things first is get the conversation started. Start talking to your board. What's keeping them all up at night? You know, do the risks that they've identified align with the risks that the organization has identified? Again, getting an idea of what their overall satisfaction is with the ERM process, with the internal audit process. Do they feel as if uh, these are really providing value? Is the information and the reporting that's coming out of there useful for them? This will, again, help to identify any potential needs for training. It's also important to administer those trainings on an annual basis to the board, um, you know, annual at a minimum, just to, again, keep them in the loop on any significant initiatives at the organization, any changes in process, anything that's going to allow them to, you know, perform their board oversight responsibilities more appropriately. Get senior management approval and involvement in the process. Designate committees or individuals to champion this. Yeah, as we mentioned, it is it is useful to, if possible, leverage existing committees or existing meetings. That way you're not putting something else on everybody's plate, but setting it as a recurring agenda item, but also explicitly defining the responsibility and the need to incorporate that into these committees' responsibilities or into these agenda meetings. Um, you know, again, it's just really important to making sure that it's top of mind for everybody and continues to be a conversation at all of these meetings. If you don't already have a playbook or a, a formal risk management or internal audit charter, I recommend putting one of those together, develop the policies and procedures, Cap just capture, you know, start by capturing what's currently in practice, what you're currently doing right now, and then you can use that as a basis to improve upon that process on an annual basis. As necessary, bring in subject matter experts, uh, whether that's individuals in-house, whether that's an outsourced consultant under all the different arrangements that Kristen had mentioned going through internal audit, um, you know, identify where your skills, knowledge, and expertise within your organization, what kind of gaps exist, uh, what your strengths are too, uh, to again, identify again, how you're going to better budget your resource allocation towards addressing risk and implementing your internal audit plan. Formalize risk reporting to the board that kind of goes along with the formalization of those policies and procedures. What does that reporting structure look like? What is the reporting format and what is information is most important to the board? And then assess the alignment of risk assessment, strategic plan and internal audit plan. That's an extremely useful exercise that I recommend anybody, any organization go through at a minimum once a year. It's just cross referencing those three items your strategic plan, risk assessment, and your internal audit plan to ensure alignment. So that way, if you're seeing that a strategic objective of the organization is to digitally transform, but then within your risk assessment, you haven't noted anything related to cybersecurity or information technology. And within the internal audit plan, you're not seeing any sort of um, engagement related to assessing IT controls, looking at the cybersecurity posture, you know, that would beg the question as to, okay, if this is a strategic objective, why are we not seeing anything related to this in our internal audit plan? Why are our other functions not you know, adequately designed to support the strategic objectives of the organization? And then again, you can then tweak uh, from there the internal audit plan or the risk assessment to, to make sure that again, you're focusing on the priorities in the areas of highest risk for the organization. So with that, I just wanted to wrap up with showing some ways that um, GRF can assist. This is specific to enterprise risk management. Um, so you know, our, our firm does really assist in kind of all areas of ERM from the initial implementation, helping our clients put together their playbook or policies, procedures, performing that initial risk assessment and getting that risk reporting structure pulled together in the form of a risk council and also training them on their appropriate responsibilities. We assist in providing those maturity assessments, benchmarking against the industry frameworks, um, you know, other, other comparable organizations, providing those recommendations for potential enhancement, and then also strengthening existing initiatives, focusing on some of those more advanced ERM concepts for uh, or an, an ERM program that may have been up and running for a couple of years and is looking to really grow and improve. We provide trainings, workshops, such as the NC State presentation, workshop that we'll be administering in February. We also do more custom tailored workshops for specific clients. Ongoing coaching and support is needed and perform, putting together indicator, uh, key risk and performance indicators, dashboards, helping to develop risk appetite and understanding what risk appetite is for your organization and assessing any kind of software needs. Again, for those organizations that may be a little bit larger or more robust, maybe considering bringing on some sort of uh, sophisticated GRC software to assist in the risk management process, we can assist our clients in assessing those needs. 
This last page just includes a couple of links uh, for our different capabilities as it relates to ERM, cybersecurity, internal audit. Everybody will be given these, these slides um, after this. They'll be available on our website, so you can go ahead and click through those. I also wanted to share some additional ERM resources. Again, when you get the slides, these are actual embedded links to these uh, white papers and event um, within the slides themselves. So these are two really great resources. Uh, this guide for nonprofits written by our very own Amy Wares is an extremely useful resource for any nonprofit organization looking to start or maybe even just improve upon their ERM journey. Uh, this item up here is a, the DC Top Risk Summit that's actually occurring next week in which we'll be talking about some more specific risks uh, related to, to fraud, information technology, cybersecurity, DEI, and ESG. And then also, again, looking at the internal external audit process and uh, looking at data visualizations as a reporting tool to the board and to management. Um, so really great resources out there in addition to this all on our website. So I would encourage anybody to, to take a look at our website. If there's something that's top of mind for you or your organization, feel free to go on there, do a quick search to see if we've probably put something out on it. Otherwise, you have our contact information here. Please feel free to reach out to us directly if there's anything we didn't get the chance to touch on or anything that you would like to ask a little bit more specific to some of the material we covered today. Um, and I did just want to stop very briefly because I, I noticed I, I plowed through a uh, one of the questions in here and staff satisfaction, could it be considered a KPI? Absolutely can be considered a KPI. Uh, you know, the thing that I would consider in terms of assessing that is, is how do you quantify that, um, you know, in order to, to really be able to assess that and assign a KPI to it, you would have to come up with some sort of mechanism for, for quantifying that, some sort of staff satisfaction survey in which you rate, you know, their overall satisfaction with their job function, with their training, all of the, the different areas that you would want to be concerned about in order to assess employee morale, uh, you know, relationships with coworkers, employee engagement, you would want to put together some sort of quiz questionnaire again to assist in quantifying that so that you could adequately set that key performance or key risk indicator. So I hope I hope that helped answer that. And I apologize for, for not noticing that when I was going through KPIs and KRIs. Uh, but yeah, with that, that'll wrap everything up. So yeah, if there are any questions, we'd, we'd love to field them. We did get we did get another one. Um, this one's Kristen. Um, could you provide more examples of topics, risks that a risk process review can address? Sure. Um, so one one um, risk for smaller organizations, especially, is fraud risk as it relates to employee expense reimbursement. So whether that's use of a company credit card or expense reports um, that employees are reimbursed for. Um, sometimes in small organizations, um, there's not as many employees and there's a lot of um, trust between employees. And so sometimes the proper controls aren't implemented. So that is a, a risk area and a process that could be reviewed as part of a risk process review. Um, and then actually another one that Mac sort of touched on is um, review over payroll. And that's sort of also come up in recent years as a higher risk area as organizations have employees working remotely in different states, um, maybe moving more frequently due to being able to work remotely. And I think that also sort of ties in with the earlier question about HR risks, um, payroll, um, you know, will we'll relate to that as well. So those are two examples. Great, and then another question is, um... Let's say you know we're a small organization. Um, what is it that we can do here? And I don't know if Amy or Mac want to jump in and, and take this one. Um, yeah. So for small organizations that you know may not have a, a formal risk council, you know I think going back to developing those policies and procedures, that's really the the best place to start for any organization. Capturing what's currently in process and you know, if there isn't a risk management process or something that's not clearly defined or it's something that's, you know, kind of done on an ad hoc basis by each individual person or department, again, putting together the system in place to clearly define the roles and responsibilities related to risk management and related to internal audit. Uh, you know, again, I think kind of defining your risk management process to identify those top risks will then also help you, you know, if you're trying to implement risk process reviews or internal audit procedures, that will give you a better idea of where to focus. Because again, as a smaller organization, your allocation of resources is, is a little bit more important. Not to say it's not important for every organization, 
but you have less funds available, you have less reserves, you know, to spend on these. So you want to make sure you're spending it in the right places. So by clearly defining those risks and those areas of priority, you can then uh, define, you know, your internal audit plan and the areas to focus on or perform those individual risk process reviews and areas in which you need to bring in an outside consultant or another party to assist in those. So no matter how small you are, the board is still responsible for risk oversight, right? So you need to be having those conversations and how what's your methodology for even determining what your top risks are, right? And to have those conversations with the board. So it's no matter how small you all are, it, it is very important. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions come through. Does anyone else have some final thoughts here as, as we wrap up? Otherwise, um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's discussion. We encourage you to follow us on social media at GRFCPAs and visit our website at www.grfcpa.com for upcoming events. And also, we have different um, under risk advisory. We have enterprise risk management um, little website. It's got all kinds of amazing resources. We have a cybersecurity page, an internal audit page, and a fraud page. So much, so much awesome um, resources for you guys. So um, I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. I hope I encourage you to join us for parts two and three of this webinar series. And don't forget, Please remember to complete the survey that will appear automatically following the session if you would like to earn CPA credit for attending today's discussion. Thank you again and have a great day.